Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Matthew, for that introduction. And thanks to, uh, to all of you uh, for being here. And thanks also, as, as uh, Matthew said, to, to Michael for uh, inviting me to, uh, to, to speak with you. Does that, does that look uh, good? Um, screen looks great. Screen looks great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let's see. So, so as um, as Matthew said, I'll be I'll be discussing tonight uh, my my book uh, Crossings: How Road Ecology Is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. Uh, and uh, you know, the book is about the science of road ecology, which is essentially the the field of study that uh, examines how uh, roads and really all of our transportation infrastructure. Uh, shape nature. And uh, of course, roads are transformative uh, in large part because there are just so many of them out there, right? There are something like 4 million uh, miles of road in the United States uh, alone, um, perhaps 40 million miles of road uh, around the world, and, and maybe another 15 million miles uh, or so that will be built by the middle of this century. We're in what's uh, been described as a, an infrastructure tsunami, uh, this wave of new construction uh that's uh that's that's sweeping across the globe um much of it you know aimed at uh, developing countries like nepal and uh myanmar and and uh, and kenya uh and you know i think in part because roads are so ubiquitous we don't really think about them very much you know we drive them we drive them every single day and they're kind of invisible to us we just sort of use them and take them for granted and you know when we do think about roads i think that most of us tend to think about roads in you know generally positive terms, right? Roads are uh, you know they're important connectors. They're how we get to schools and hospitals and uh, entertainment centers. You know they're how we get our goods to market. Uh, you know they're these wonderful symbols of human freedom and mobility. You know Kerouac and Springsteen celebrating the the kind of the the mythos of uh, of of the the open road uh, as again this this ultimate object of, uh, of, of human uh, human movement, um, which is somewhat ironic because, you know, they for all of the movement that they uh, facilitate in humans, of course, they do the exact opposite uh, for most other organisms, right? They curtail mobility and movement and, and, uh, and wild animal freedom. Uh, so road ecology is, you know, really the sort of the study of, of all of the different ways that uh, that roads distort the natural world. Uh, you know, a few of them I, that I think are, are worth highlighting uh, are that roads are these these vectors of invasive species movement, right? All kinds of all kinds of animals essentially disperse into novel landscapes along a grid. Uh, you know, this is a this kind of these these purple flowers are musk thistle that uh, were trans the seeds were transported in uh, in truck tires. Uh, this is a logging road in Montana, an old logging road that I visited, uh, and uh, so all of these seeds got transported in the, the treads of truck tires, and now there's this kind of eerie purple swath of invasive vegetation uh, across the landscape. Roads are zones of erosion, right? You know, the, uh, I think unbeknownst to most people, the U.S. Forest Service is the largest road manager on earth. There's something like 400,000 miles of Forest Service road out there. Ben, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your slides are not advancing, at least for me, they're not. Oh no, okay, let's see. Let me see, uh, I wonder why that's happening. Um, is anyone seeing? Was, I was just about to say the same thing. Okay. Oh man, okay. Um, let's yeah, try. Yeah, let's only see. Yeah, th well, thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Um, let's try that one more time. Um, let's see. Okay. Does that look better? Are those are there are, are those slides moving? They're moving. Yeah, yeah they're okay, they're great. moving through too. Sorry about that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, anyway, here's the here's the um, here's that swath of uh, purple thistle uh, that I was I was describing so lyrically without the benefit of a uh, of a visual aid. Um, so uh, so so roads are you know, they're, they're vectors of invasive species transport. Uh, you know they're they're these uh, kind of these areas of erosion. Um, you know I mentioned that U.S. Forest Service is the world's largest road manager, something like four hundred thousand road miles uh, around the country. Uh, the vast majority of them are dirt. You know so you get a big uh, snow melt uh, event or a big uh, a big rain event, and you know all of that that surface basically liquefies, and all of that sediment is swept down down slope into uh, streams and smothers. Uh, 
fish spawning gravels and eggs. Um, so roads are these forces of, uh, of, of erosion and sediment transport. Um, they're, they're sort of these sources of pollution as well, right? Our, our cars are constantly uh, shedding cadmium and zinc and copper and microplastics and all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, it, uh, a few years ago, uh, scientists figured out that this kind of series of coho salmon die-offs in the Puget Sound watershed was attributable to uh, 6PPD, a, a, a chemical added to tires to uh, basically protect them from ozone. And all of those tire particles were transporting this chemical uh, into streams, which was which was killing salmon uh, on a, a pretty a pretty massive scale. And again, this is you know some obscure chemical that nobody had ever heard of, um, and turns out to be uh, you know this this enormous source of uh, of, of um, fish mortality. Uh, another kind of chemical connection with roads is that roads are these strips of salt, right? We add 20 million tons of road salt uh, to our highways every winter as a, uh, as a de-icer. Uh, and of course, all of that salt runs off into uh, rivers and lakes and turns fresh water uh, brackish. And it's also an ecological trap, right? It lures animals uh, to the roadway and, and thus uh, endangers them because, because, of course, we know that animals are attracted to uh, to salt licks. We basically turned our road system into this multi-million mile salt lick, uh, essentially. Uh, I will say that the, that kind of that salt attractant uh, effect inspired my favorite uh, road sign, which is uh, in Jasper National Park in Canada. Every winter they put up signs saying, do not let moose lick your car. Uh, I'm not sure that you could stop a moose from licking your car. If a moose really wants to lick your car, it's probably gonna lick your car, uh, but you know, you can you can try. Uh, roads are also these, you know, kind of hellscapes of noise, right? Road noise pollution is an enormous form of habitat loss. If you're, a, you know, a meadowlark or any other bird, uh, you know, and you have to sing to attract a mate, uh, well, your prospective mate can't hear you over the, you know, the incessant uh, rumble of, of engines and tires and you functionally can't live in that place, right? So a road might only be, you know, 100 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, and yet it's casting this acoustic shadow that can, you know, span a, a mile or two uh, in, in many cases. And here's just one quick video illustrating the concept of, of road noise as habitat loss, because I think it's a, a pretty important um, concept. This, these are uh, grizzly bears in uh, British Columbia, I believe. Right, so see that as soon as the this you know the snarl of that uh, that ATV shows up, right, the bears flee the area. So again, that's you know that's not uh, you know that's not a, that's not a visual cue. That's an auditory cue, and you know of course you're you're birders, so you're you know more sensitive to uh, to to noise and sound than than most. And you know you know that animals live by the grace of their hearing, essentially. And you know anything that prevents uh, anything that masks those acoustic signals is a big problem. But it's not all doom and gloom necessarily, right? Roads uh, create some winners as well as losers. They're, you know, they're novel ecosystems in a, in a sense. Uh, a couple years ago, I visited uh, this highway overpass in Minnesota and there were hundreds of little brown bats roosting in the crevices of the overpass, uh, you know, taking advantage of this, this habitat that our, our road network uh, had created for them. Uh, you know, another kind of uh, road beneficiary in a sense are many pollinators you know you you uh you know i mean these roads are cutting through uh areas that are you know basically agricultural uh wastelands in some in some respects and you know the only strips of uh you know of native vegetation left on the landscape are those those roadsides right and you know in the case of monarch butterflies uh you know that midwestern uh monarch migration essentially follows i-35 uh, you know, from Minnesota to Texas, because, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's uh, bordered by these, uh, you know, these, these strips of, uh, of, of native prairie. Uh, and, you know, I mean, probably the most sort of conspicuous way in which, uh, you know, roads and, and nature interact are, is, the, is through the form of roadkill, right? We've all seen the, uh, you know, the, the carcass uh, by the, the side of the highway, be it uh, deer or raccoon or, or a squirrel or, or what have you. And I think, you know, in part because roadkill, like roads themselves, are so ubiquitous, you know, we tend to uh, ignore it. You know, it's, it's somewhat uh, invisible to us. And I think as a result, we, we kind of discount roadkill 
Uh, as a, a, a catastrophic form of, uh, of, of biodiversity loss and uh, ecological collapse. Uh, but in fact, more than a million animals are killed uh, in the United States every day by cars. And those are just vertebrate animals, uh, to say nothing of all of the insects. Um, that, and that's, you know, they, that's a, that one million animals a day. It's a commonly cited estimate. Uh, I think it's a dramatic underestimate. Uh, you know, more recent studies have suggested that as many as 300 million birds alone are being killed by cars every year. Um, so, you know, you certainly add up all of the uh, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And, you know, I, I would imagine um, that we're talking about many millions uh, of animals being, being killed killed by cars uh, every day. Um, of course, it's, you know, even though the, the common animals like the white-tailed deer and the raccoons are the ones that we tend to see because they're the most abundant, of course, uh, you know, roadkill is an existential threat uh, for many uh, threatened and endangered species. There are several dozen listed species for which roadkill is the, the primary source of, uh, of mortality. Uh, and, you know, as scientists have noted, uh, it is the leading direct human cause of, uh, of wildlife mortality on land, right? There's nothing that we do that kills more animals, uh, more wild animals on land than drive, uh, which I think is a, a pretty uh, astonishing thing to uh, to think about. Uh, you know, and I think that in large measure, you know, the reason that, uh, that roadkill is so pernicious and destructive is that in a sense it, uh, you know, it, it undermines and even hijacks uh, evolution. You know, you think about the, the, the defense mechanisms of many of our uh, most beloved species, turtles that withdraw into their shells or porcupines that bristle their quills or skunks that spray or, you know, newts that uh, kind of rely on their toxic skin. Uh, you know, these are these kind of stand your ground strategies that evolved over thousands of generations and worked really well uh, against hawks and coyotes and foxes and other natural predators. Uh, but of course, you know, when your predator uh, is a, an F-150 barreling down the highway at 70 miles an hour, the worst possible thing you can do is with is withdraw into your shell, right? Standing your ground is actually a, a terrible strategy. And so I, I find that, uh, you know, kind of tragic and poignant to contemplate the way in which, you know, a hundred years or so of automobility uh, has undermined uh, millions of years of, uh, of, of natural selection. And of course, it's not just, you know, it's not just uh, wild animals that that suffer in these these animal vehicle collisions, although certainly they get the worst of it. Uh, you know, it's it's also uh, we human beings, obviously, uh, collisions, especially with large animals are, are really dangerous events. You know, deer, uh, white tailed deer are the single most dangerous wild animal uh, in the United States. Um, of course, it's not the deer's fault. Uh, it's the car's fault. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, you know, these these animal vehicle collisions are, are uh, problematic events. Um, a few really amazing uh, wildlife vehicle collision statistics in general, I think. Um, you know, there are between one and two million collisions with large animals uh, every year with, with, I mean, that's really just deer, essentially, you know, pri primarily uh, whitetail and mule deer. So there's, you know, there's a deer killed by a car uh, or hit by a car every 30 seconds in the U.S., which means that, uh, you know, uh, several dozen will be killed uh, by, the, by the end of this presentation. Um, the average deer collision costs society more than $9,000 in hospital bills, vehicle repairs, tow truck costs, insurance costs, and so on, right? So these are these very expensive events as well as being dangerous events. Uh, up to 400 drivers are killed in deer collisions uh, every year. So again, deer are the most dangerous wild animal, more than sharks, snakes, bees, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, in California alone, uh, you know, the annual uh, damages in wildlife vehicle collisions are around $230 million. Um, so again, these are, these are uh, you know, these, these really uh, problematic uh, events, both for wild animals and for, uh, and for human beings. And I think it's worth noting that, uh, you know, that these, these wildlife vehicle collisions, especially these deer vehicle collisions, you know, they're really only part of the problem. Um, for for the animals themselves, right? I, you know, I think that we've all, again, we've all seen the carcass by the side uh, of the road, but what you don't see are the animals that never cross because the traffic is essentially too dense uh, for them to sort of penetrate that moving wall of vehicles. And, and uh, you know, in some ways that's that's almost more problematic, I think, than, uh, than roadkill itself. And I just wanted to show uh, a quick video that I, that I think illustrates this point, how difficult it is uh, for wild animals to successfully cross uh, roadways. So let's just let's just let this video play out for a second. This is these are um, these are these are mule deer.
you can see that it's just you know that's that it's just a you know it's just very difficult for these animals to make it through this you know this this relatively frequent stream of traffic um and i you know i, I would i would point out uh, that you know, this is this is actually this is a two-lane rural highway in Wyoming, right? This is not the 101. This is not some you know giant uh, interstate highway. This is a relatively quiet road that's probably seeing you know a couple thousand cars a day, uh, and yet you know these these road crossing events uh, for uh, for for deer and other species are you know they're not they're not fluid, right? They're they're these really difficult, uh, dangerous, uh, risky risky crossings. So again, you know that's that's uh, you know probably a, a road with a couple of thousand cars a day. Um, you know, roads with more than ten thousand vehicles per day are, are absolute barriers to wildlife movement. Right, that that kind of impenetrable wall of traffic is just too dense for them to even uh, try crossing. And you know, to, for reference, I mean, roads with more than ten thousand vehicles per day—that's basically every uh, you know major highway in California, right? Um, you know, the the one hundred one, for example, has three hundred thousand vehicles a day. So you know, so animals essentially never uh, attempt to cross. And the fact that we've created these impenetrable walls of traffic uh, is, is enormously problematic. And, you know, one case study that I think illustrates that point uh, is a, this herd of, uh, of mule deer in the Red Desert that uh, I, I dealt with in one chapter of this book. Um, and, I, you know, I spent uh, a week or so with the, the biologist researching these deer and, you know, you can see that they put satellite collars on the deer and then turn them loose and, you know, kind of watch to uh, see where they, where they migrate. Um, and what those researchers have found is that deer essentially never cross uh, interstate highways, right? So here's, you know, here is kind of this big purple blob is basically, you know, clusters of mule deer locations generated by these satellite collars. Uh, and you can see here's I-80, right? Here's the big, uh, you know, the big interstate highway that, that runs through uh, southern Wyoming. Uh, and deer essentially never get past uh, that interstate. Um, and that's a big problem because all of the really good winter range is south of I-80. Uh, you know, ideally they would keep going past that interstate, especially in, you know, harsh winters when there's lots of snow on the ground. Um, but, you know, it, because they can't cross the interstate, uh, you know, they end up starving uh, and and mass uh, in some not particularly harsh years. And, you know, again, that's almost worse than roadkill, right? You could imagine that, you know, a herd of, uh, you know, a thousand mule deer, they can survive a few collisions on the highway. You know, what they can't survive is losing access to all of that uh, really in, important habitat. So that moving fence of traffic uh, is, again, almost almost worse than roadkill itself for, for some uh, some populations. Here's another uh, another figure that kind of illustrates the same point. I think uh, this is these are collar uh, satellite collar locations on a, a young male grizzly bear uh, in Montana, and, and uh, the white line here is I-90, uh, and you can just see that over the course of two years, I mean, this grizzly bear spent two years trying to cross I-90. Every single red X. Uh, along the interstate is a point where the bear approached the highway and basically bounced off like a ping pong ball, right? So the bear, again, spent two years, uh, you know, trying to uh, to cross this road before finally making it, um, you know, in, in, uh, in 2021. But, uh, you know, you can just see that, again, you know, this road is 150 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, and yet it's denying this animal access to millions of acres of, uh, of, of potential habitat. Another figure, uh, you know, a, f a familiar one to uh, to Californians probably. Um, this is uh, this is the, the very famous mountain lion population uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains, west of Los Angeles. Uh, and every sort of colorful dot cluster uh, are basically the the, uh, the satellite collar locations of a different individual mountain lion. You know, here's and here's the 101. Uh, the 405 is kind of on the east uh, side of the screen here. Uh, and you can just see that, you know, the animals, again, essentially never cross uh, these big uh, these big freeways. Um, and that's, of course, hugely problematic uh, because, you know, all of the mountain lions in the Santa Monica's are basically stuck in this little island of habitat. And no new mountain lions can cross the 101 to enter the population. Uh, and as a result, you know, these animals have been stuck, essentially, uh, breeding with their own daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters and they've become uh, very inbred over time um, and they're suffering uh, genetic defects and uh, they've entered what uh, biologists have called an extinction vortex this kind of long-term uh, doom spiral if nothing is uh, is done to save them and fortunately something is being done and we'll talk about that in a second but you know for now I think the point is uh, again this you know this genetic fragmentation that roads inflict um, is just as problematic as you know as the wildlife vehicle collisions and you know in some ways uh, even even more so. 
So what do we do about this? You know, these the sort of these two linked problems, right? Wildlife vehicle collisions, all of this road mortality that's happening, uh, and then uh, this this additional problem of, of habitat fragmentation that uh, you know that these walls of traffic are creating. And you know, really the best tool in our toolbox for solving those two linked problems are wildlife crossings, right? These bridges, underpasses, tunnels uh, that, uh, you know, that theoretically reconnect populations and allow them to meet and mingle and mate and keep them off the road um, safely. Uh, and you know, wildlife crossings, they really, they really begin, uh, you know, in the mid 20th century. And one of the things I try to do in this book is, is sort of trace the history of this idea uh, of building dedicated structures for wild animals. And, you know, these, these, uh, these crossings really begin uh, in the middle of the 20th century in, in Western Europe, uh, France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, you know, build lots of early wildlife crossings uh, in the middle of the century. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, is really uh, sort of the best country about this sort of thing, certainly has the highest density of wildlife crossings of, uh, of any country uh, in the world. This is a really cool uh, Dutch wildlife crossing. It's about a kilometer long and it spans two highways, a railroad, uh, a sports complex and a business park. Um, the whole thing is about a, a kilometer long and, and uh, you know, kind of dwarfs uh, even all, all of our, our uh, biggest projects here in the US. So wildlife crossings, you know, begin in Europe, uh, and, they, and they really take off uh, once they get to Canada. You know, Banff National Park uh, begins building wildlife crossings in the 1980s. Uh, today, Banff has about 40 wildlife crossings, including a half dozen uh, wildlife overpasses. Um, and, you know, it's those very prominent, famous, visible wildlife crossings in Banff over the, the Trans-Canada Highway uh, that kind of make this concept and this technology, uh, you know, really take off uh, around, around the world. Uh, and in Banff, you know, the primary target species for a lot of these crossings are grizzly bears, uh, which were, you know, like the mountain lions of the Santa Monica's genetically fragmented by the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, and many years of research in Banff uh, showed very um, convincingly and, and conclusively uh, that, uh, that, that these crossings were sufficient to reconnect these genetically fragmented populations and that female bears were crossing the highway repeatedly. You know, they were breeding on either side. They were teaching their cubs how to cross and their cubs became crossers. And there's this cool sort of intergenerational cycle uh, of, uh, of grizzly bears using these structures and allowing gene flow to continue uh, across, across the highway. So the Banff crossings are really um, you know, hugely significant in the history of uh, this, this road ecology movement. Here in the U.S., most of most early wildlife crossings, you know, they're, they're sort of the first ones are built during the 1970s, um, really in like intermountain western states, um, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah. Those are sort of the, you know, some of the, the, the big uh, early ones. And, uh, you know, a lot of the early wildlife crossings were built for mule deer and elk, um, you know, for the reason that, again, you know, in the intermountain west, you know, we've got these big migratory herds that that move long distances along relatively predictable pathways. And when you, you know, when you get a thousand mule deer crossing a highway uh, and there's this big pile of, you know, 50 carcasses, uh, well, that's a pretty good indication that that's a, a good, a good spot for a, a wildlife crossing. So mule deer, you know, becomes sort of this early test case um, in the history of wildlife crossings and connectivity um, and, you know, and show that, yes, in fact, uh, animals will use these structures. Uh, you know, they use them more confidently over time. You know, they teach their herd mates to uh, to use them, uh, and you can really pass these very large numbers of animals uh, through relatively simple structures like this. You know, kind of modified box culvert in uh, in Wyoming. Uh, another really important lesson that uh, you know that wildlife biologists learn uh, over time is that fences are integral to making wildlife crossings work. Right? People always ask, how, "How do the animals know to use the crossings?" And the answer is, you know, roadside fences basically direct them to the crossings. Right? And you know, the fences aren't as beautiful and sexy as the as the you know the huge lovely overpasses, but the fences are really critical to making uh, wildlife crossings effective because again, that's really how that's really what funnels the animals. Um, to the crossings. Another important part of all of this infrastructure are, are jump outs, you know, these one-way escape ramps so that if an animal does somehow get through the fence onto the highway, uh, you know, they can hopefully find one of these exit ramps to uh, leap off the uh, out of the road corridor. Um, so these are, that's, that's kind of a, a critical part of these wildlife crossing networks as well, are, are uh, these, these one-way escape ramps. And, you know, over time, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think biologists have realized is that 
you know, obviously different animals have different crossing requirements, right? Some species like pronghorn uh, and elk really prefer going over crossings uh, or over highways via overpasses. You know, some like uh, like mountain lions are very content to go uh, through underpasses. Uh, you know, some uh, animals like otters and beavers, of course, are, you know, are, are stream associated animals that, you know, that need crossings associated with streams uh, and so on. So, you know, what lots of um, sort of road ecology projects attempt to do now is, is you know, sort of give animals this buffet to choose from. And, you know, one example of that is, is uh, on I-90 um, near Seattle up on uh, Snoqualmie Pass. Uh, there are about 20 wildlife crossings there now, and they kind of run the, the whole gamut. Um, there's uh, a big, beautiful overpass uh, here on the screen that uh, you can see they, they put all of these uh, all of these logs and rocks and other sort of, you know, habitat structural elements up there for reptiles and amphibians and rodents, you know, smaller animals that need some hiding cover. Um, you know, they, they also created a few of these, uh, these giant, really capacious, you know, open span um, underpasses. Uh, there are these kind of these lines of rocks running through these underpasses that actually get used by pikas, which is which is uh, pretty pretty cool. Um, and uh, they've also got uh, these you know these kind of modified uh, in in enlarged uh, box culverts uh, at stream crossings that get used by uh, you know everything from salamanders to uh, to beavers. So again, they're just trying to to account for the entirety of the ecosystem um, with these these diverse networks of crossings. And here's just kind of a cool video that uh, the Washington State Department of transportation pulled together illustrating the uh, entire the ecosystem using these uh, these structures I did not choose this music Hi, Eddie. And some, and some otters. I think that's the kind of the coup de gras. So anyway, that's that's what you're trying to do, right? It's just to account for the entirety of the system and you know and give as many different species uh, as many different options as possible. Uh, so you know one common objection that you hear around wildlife crossing sometimes is you know wait a second aren't these things really expensive, right? Don't they cost you know several million dollars a pop typically? Uh, that's you know a very common complaint. And you know I think that the uh, the important point to remember there, right, is that these these structures in combination with the fences are preventing lots of dangerous, expensive vehicle collisions, and thus, in many cases, paying for themselves pretty rapidly. And, you know, in, in one illustration of that, this is uh, a wildlife overpass in uh, in Pinedale, Wyoming, that was built for, uh, for pronghorn. Um, and, you know, when this was proposed, you know, of course, all of the fiscal conservatives in Wyoming were kind of up in arms. Uh, you know, are we really, are really going to spend, you know, millions of dollars uh, on a, to help uh, antelope cross the road? That sounds kind of nuts. Um, but, you know, what researchers found in this instance uh, was that, uh, you know, collisions were reduced by around 81%, so, you know, close to 70 uh, collisions prevented every year. Um, and by avoiding all of those dangerous, expensive crashes, uh, you know, this passage basically saved the public enough money uh, to pay for its own construction costs in about four years, right? So these, these structures are, are actually totally self-funding in in, uh, in in many cases. And you know, that's a big part of why uh, you know, transportation departments, which were historically reluctant to build these sorts of things, uh, are increasingly enthusiastic about them because they recognize that, you know, again, these are um, really thrifty structures in a lot of ways and they, they pay for themselves pretty pretty readily. And here's just one cool video of, uh, of those those crossings in uh, in, in Wyoming getting uh, getting used by pronghorn just because I, I just love watching big herds of antelope run across these structures. And you know, kind of the, the other cool thing that you can sort of see in this uh, in this video, right, is that over time, as more and more animal animals use these things, you know, of course they create game trails essentially. And you know, often you visit a wildlife crossing, and there's this amazing network of animal paths, you know, spider webbing up into the into the uh, the sagebrush or into the forest, uh, and that and that actually guides 
other animals to the crossing, right? So it's almost like the entire ecosystem collectively learns how to use these things, which is which is pretty cool. So you know, I think at this point in the, the history of uh, of road ecology, you know, we've 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 um, you know we've gotten pretty good, and we're pretty enthusiastic when it comes to building wildlife crossings for large common ungulates, right? We build lot, we've built lots of crossings for mule deer and elk and antelope and moose, uh, you know, all of these big animals uh, that, uh, you know, that endanger driver safety uh, and cost the public a lot of money in, uh, you know, in, in crash expenses. Uh, the problem with that, that approach uh, is that there are lots of creatures that get left out, right? We've built lots of crossings for deer and very few crossings for uh, amphibians and reptiles and, uh, you know, and rodents and, uh, you know, all of the smaller animals that are enormous conservation concerns, uh, you know, due to roadkill, but aren't necessarily um, threats to driver safety, right? Nobody's ever, uh, you know, totaled their car hitting a northern red-legged frog. Uh, so, you know, we tend we tend not to mitigate for these animals um, very frequently. Um, and uh, as a result, you know, we're, we're stuck uh, in many cases, uh, you know, moving animals across, moving amphibians, especially across the highway uh, by hand. You know, there's uh, there's the very famous uh, newt brigade uh, near near Petaluma that moves thousands of newts uh, in buckets, essentially. And, you know, that's that's lovely and, you know, sort of helping to protect that population for now. Um, but, you know, certainly the, the better solution there would be a, a wildlife crossing, which they're advocating for. But, you know, again, it's, it's sort of harder to justify a, a newt crossing at least from a cost benefit perspective. Uh, you know, I don't want to say we haven't done any of this stuff. You know, certainly there are instances of really effective amphibian mitigation. Uh, there's a really good one in the Sierras, actually, for the uh, for the Yosemite toad, uh, where basically the Forest Service uh, put in an elevated stretch of of, uh, of roadway um, where uh, this this toad migration, uh, you know, goes uh, down this little ravine. Um, and uh, the toads have, in fact, uh, used the the structure. Here's the here's the toad uh, right there, hopping uh, under this uh, this elevated stretch of roadway. Right. So amphibian mitigation is possible. Um, we just haven't really uh, made it a, a priority. Uh, other countries that I would I would note are, I think, better at building wildlife crossings for, uh, you know, these this kind of the whole diversity of organisms uh, that, you know, inhabits their ecosystems. Uh, you know, here's a very famous uh, crab crossing and on Christmas Island um, with this, you know, this enormous population of millions of red crabs that migrate to the beach uh, to spawn every year and, uh, you know, get crushed in the process. So they built this uh, really wonderful, iconic uh, crab bridge. And it's sort of hard to imagine the U.S. Uh, building a crab bridge, right? But we can, we can, we can dream for sure. Uh, another cool example of, uh, you know, sort of innovation in other countries, um, this is a uh, an Australian squirrel glider, a little arboreal uh, marsupial, um, and, you know, squirrel gliders, they, don't, they basically never descend to the forest floor, right, so they would, they, they would never use a conventional wildlife underpass, so if you're going to reconnect these forest fragments, you have to do it with these, you know, rope bridges and ladders, which, uh, you know, the Australian Highway Department string between, uh, you know, forest Patches that are fragmented by uh, by highways, right? And squirrel gliders use these very readily. And you know, I would I would point out that look, we've got plenty of uh, arboreal mammals here in the U.S., right? We've got you know martins and uh, flying squirrels and porcupines and all kinds of critters that would benefit um, from this 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 sort of uh, you know canopy mitigation. But we just have not made that a priority, right? So there's lots that we can learn, uh, I think, from other other countries. And, you know, in addition to uh, to building wildlife crossings for more species, you know, we just need them in more places, right? We need just, we just need a lot more of them, um, you know, and, and uh, I, I uh, you know, I mentioned those, those kind of inbred mountain lions in the Santa Monica Mountains. And of course, you know, they're, they're in the process of getting their own wildlife crossing right now, you know, this gigantic, um, nearly $100 million uh, overpass that will span uh, the, the 101 and hopefully reconnect that little fragmented population with mountain lions elsewhere in California. Um, and, you know, look, the 101 there is there's 300,000 cars a day, uh, you know, it's 10 lanes of traffic plus shoulders, so really 12 lanes. I mean, if we can build a wildlife crossing over this thing, you know, we can truly uh, build it, uh, we can build one over, over any road in the country. Um, and so, you know, we just need to increase our ambition and the, the sort of the scale, I think, at which we're, uh, we're envisioning these, these projects. 
Um, and I would add that, you know, that California has really become uh, a leader in this, uh, you know, in this field that California I was just on a, a webinar with, uh, with Chuck Bonham, of course, who's the director of, uh, of CDFW. Uh, and he said that California has spent uh, $90 million in the past two years in wildlife crossing planning and implementation um, with, you know, plans to spend uh, a lot, a lot more. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, I'll point out that you know there's also much more funding for uh, you know for these sorts of projects uh, on a, a national scale as well. Uh, you know, the 2021 Infrastructure Act included a 350 million dollar uh, grant program to exclusively for uh, for for wildlife crossings, um, which is great. You know, and that's certainly more money that we than we've ever allocated to this cause before. Um, but you know, it's still a, a tiny fraction uh, of you know of what's really needed to address this problem at a large scale. So we're doing more than ever before, but you know, we still need a, a lot more funding. Funding um, to to, uh, to to mitigate all of the roadkill hotspots out there and, and barriers to connectivity. Uh, you know, I'd note that, that fish need safe passage as well, right? And in fact, the Infrastructure Act has a billion dollars for new culverts. You know, every every uh, road culvert, uh, you know, all of those little battered corrugated pipes that we drive over, uh, you know, a thousand times a day. Uh, you know, every one of those is a potential fish passage barrier, right? Uh, we need to, you know, sort of open those culverts up uh, and just give streams room to, you know, to kind of flow naturally and allow fish to uh, to uh, migrate, you know, unrestricted by uh, all of those. Uh, kind of overly restrictive uh, faulty pipes out there and you know these aren't very glamorous projects right they're not like a hundred million dollar overpass that we're all going to notice and you know ooh and ah over um, but they're really important and you know here's one example this is a, a stream outside of Seattle uh, that used to flow through a very narrow pipe uh, that was too restrictive really for uh, for fish to uh, swim through um, and they tore that pipe out you know, put in a, a big new uh, box culvert that allows the stream to just flow naturally. And here's in the lower left-hand corner, here's a, a chum salmon getting ready to uh, swim through that, uh, that culvert, which is pretty exciting. I'd also note that, uh, you know, all of those culverts are potential wildlife crossings, right? We have maybe 2,000 dedicated wildlife crossings in the U.S. and possibly 2 million culverts. Uh, and, you know, animals are already using those culverts uh, as, uh, as, as wildlife crossings to navigate highways. And here's just, you know, a very famous video that I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, a million times um, of a, uh, a coyote and uh, a badger cooperatively hunting. Um, in uh, in uh, you know in the, in the Bay Area, um, and uh, I just love that they're using uh, using a culvert to uh, to to cross uh, cross the highway. And again, of course, that culvert was not designed for wildlife passage, and yet you know animals are uh, you know immensely clever and flexible and adaptive, and they'll you know they'll kind of use whatever we we put out there for them. Uh, and you know there there are things we can do to make our culverts even more functional as as wildlife crossings. Uh, you know here's a kind of a cool um, what's known as a critter shelf. Uh, so this is a culvert on Highway 93 in Montana. Uh, it's you know seasonally partially flooded when uh, you know the kind of the Jason wetland comes up, um, and so uh, you know biologists put in this uh, this little catwalk basically that uh, gets used by skunks and weasels and bobcats and all all kinds of other critters that don't like getting their paws wet in the uh, in the spring, right? So not every wildlife crossing has to be a, a big beautiful overpass. You know, there's lots we can do when it comes to tweaking and retrofitting existing infrastructure that's already uh, on the on the land. And then I'll just add that, uh, you know, the, the other kind of opportunity before us is to uh, to unbuild some roads, right? The Infrastructure Act also includes $250 million for forest road decommissioning, you know, all of those U.S. Forest Service roads that are out there hemorrhaging sediment into our, our fish bearing streams. Uh, you know, let's get rid of some of that stuff, uh, tear it up, replant it and uh, let let nature reclaim uh, our infrastructure, right? So just because we built a road a century ago, doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, you know it's a permanent feature on the landscape and you know there's a great opportunity now to to remove some of those historically uh, you know obsolete and, and harmful roads. So ultimately, you know, the task before us is really to remake our infrastructure on behalf of biodiversity. Right? We know that we're in the middle of this uh, you know this extinction uh, crisis. You know, the the uh, the sixth mass extinction in our planet's history. Uh, and infrastructure is a you know an enormous and largely uh, unsung, unrecognized contributor to that extinction event. You know, again, there's nothing that we do that kills as many animals uh, as drive. And you know, our our uh, our task is really to uh, rebuild this country uh, for the sake of wildlife and a, a lot of 
lot of ways. And, you know, one example of that, this is a, uh, a wildlife crossing that I visited in Texas recently for ocelots. Uh, you know, ocelots are one of the rarest uh, species in this country. There are, you know, 60 to 80 ocelots left uh, in South Texas and road mortality is uh, is the the number one cause of death for that uh, that population. So this is an animal that truly will not survive uh, unless we we modify our infrastructure to uh, to to permit it to uh, persist. Uh, so if if uh, if this conversation only kind of whet your appetite for uh, for juicy road ecology content, uh, I'll add that uh, again. I, I just I have a, a new book uh, out this fall uh, called Crossings uh, about this uh, this very subject. Um, the, uh, the New York Times and uh, the Wall Street Journal both loved it. Um, so, you know, liberals and conservatives coming together to uh, to uh, unite around this topic. Um, I think Michael Hawk was a fan too, um, most most important. And uh, yeah, with that with that, I'll say uh, thank you guys so much for uh, for coming out tonight, and uh, happy to take some questions if you have them. Oh, Ben, that's that's a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I do have one quick question while um, Barry kind of filters through the, the chat. And if you have questions, go ahead and start entering them into chat and, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. But um, a year or two ago, uh, uh, Shani Kleinhaus and our Environmental Action Committee uh, uh, hosted a uh, light symposium. And they're talking about light as a barrier for crossings of roads. And I wonder if you could talk for a moment about that, because um, I noticed that a lot of your shots were uh, nighttime shots and they were not lit. So uh, how do you think that plays in um, in the plan to to make better crossings? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's it's, it's actually it's it's good timing because just um, last week, um, I, I think somebody here mentioned uh, Winston Vickers, um, you know, who's a great mountain lion uh, biologist in California, um, you know, studied the the mountain lines in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, extensively, and you know, and, and he and he and others uh, just put out a paper very recently, basically showing exactly that that you know that mountain lions in particular, um, you know, really avoid uh, bright lights, and you know they also and as a result they uh, often avoid wildlife crossings, right? Because you know to reach a wildlife crossing you have to approach a road, um, but the road is this corridor of, of both noise and light pollution, right? And, and so, you know, if, if you don't deal with that light pollution somehow, that can be an, a, a deterrent um, for, for uh, animals even approaching the road to find the wildlife crossing, right? So, you know, that's a, that's a, a big problem they're confronting, um, uh, you know, with that, that mountain lion crossing on the 101, you know, the very famous Liberty Canyon crossing, because that, you know, that, of course, is the busiest uh, freeway in America. So it has, you know, it has enormous uh, noise and light pollution problems, um, and you know there, uh, you know in the in the design of that crossing, uh, you know they've taken lots of steps to basically block that noise and light pollution. You know there are vegetated screens and berms and rock walls and all kinds of other kind of landscape architecture features um, to to basically uh, you know prevent uh, animals from being put off by by sensory pollution. So certainly you know the light pollution issue is a, a big uh, a big problem and and uh, you know one that um, road ecologists are you know trying to deal with in, in wildlife crossing design now. So I hadn't even thought of noise as being a barrier until you spoke about it tonight. That's fascinating. Um, so I'm I'm wondering, uh, Barry, have you found any questions in the chat that uh, we should pose? There, there are only a couple of questions in the chat. I think we were all riveted by your talk, so I think nobody was writing <laughs> questions. Um, but one of them was about the you showed pikas crossing at a wildlife crossing, and somebody was asking, aren't pikas um, high high elevation creatures? So that must have been a high altitude area that had the crossings that the pikes were using. Yeah, this, those crossings on I-90, those are at Snoqualmie Pass. And I, I forget the elevation, but it's basically, you know, it's basically where I-90 crests the, the Cascades. Um, and there are, uh, there are pikes up there. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, the other question was early on, and I think you addressed some of it, but it was, it was generally about, you know, why are, why have other countries been a lot more proactive around wildlife crossings than the U.S. is it because you know we're always getting getting the funding cut for in, even regular infrastructure projects, and this seems like you know another level beyond that. Yeah, you know it's a, it, it's a really good question. I mean, it's you know part of it's certainly funding, although we you know we have we obviously have plenty of funding for infrastructure um, in this country. You know, federal and state road budgets are are uh, immense. You know, I think it's you know it's 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 more cultural than anything else. We just haven't. 
um, prioritized these sorts of projects, I think, until relatively recently. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to um, a Dutch a Dutch biologist who you know who'd lived in uh, in Montana for for many years. Uh, you know, and we had a, we had a really interesting conversation about the differences between the two countries. You know, and the the point that he made mm -hmm. that I thought was interesting was that, you know, in the Netherlands they have such high road densities that you almost if you're going to have any wildlife at all you have to confront this problem right if you didn't you know and they've built passages for badgers and hedgehogs and polecats and all of these critters that you know we would we, we would never uh, never think about um and you know and the reason again is because they're just so densely developed um that uh, you know they they have to confront the road problem if they're if they're going to protect anything um whereas you know his point was that here in the u.s you know we have these you know these large bot these large blocks of uh, of public land that you know maybe kind of like lull us into a false sense of, secu of security. You know we don't think about roads as much because oh there's you know like there's so much habitat it's out there. You know, it's yeah. huge. Exactly <laughs> right. You know the animals are doing fine, um, and as a result, you know we haven't uh, really been forced to uh, to deal with this problem. But you know we're increasingly discovering that actually you know our big blocks of public land aren't big enough, um, and you know you know and that and that uh, animals you know move across enormous. Uh, ranges for the you know to find the resources they need and you know those those movements uh, take them across roads and we do have to deal with this problem. So okay. um, I've actually seen some of the crossings that you uh, showed in the presentation, including uh, the ones in Banff, which are just gorgeous to look at. Um, and I, I'm uh, you know I think a lot of people probably imagine that crossings are going to be ugly and industrial looking and but they're they can be quite beautiful. I, I, I think it's a real could be a selling point for. Uh, for officials to to uh, you know get these across, but um, if you were to kind of uh, uh, spotlight the area that needs the most uh, attention as far as crossings go, um, both in the in the U.S. and also in California, where would you say those would be? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good um, a good question. I mean, I think that. Um, you know, in in the U.S., and I think there's an interesting divide. Um, you know, the Western states have been have been pretty good about this uh, issue, and you know, and and, uh, and Eastern states, are, you know, really have done almost nothing uh, about it to this mm -hmm. to this point. So, you know, I think I'd, I would love to see uh, you know all of the all of the uh, Eastern states, uh, you know, sort of jump on this uh, this idea a, a, a little bit a little bit more. Um, you know, I think there's this. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm not I'm not entirely sure why that is. You know, maybe it's because they just have uh, you know white-tailed deer all over the place, and it, you know, it's sort of hard to identify hotspots for mitigation and so they just kind of throw their hands up and say we can't do anything about it um but you know I, yeah i guess i think i think nationally you know I'd, I'd love to see um i'd love to see more action uh you know on the east coast uh in in california um that's a good question i mean I, you know I'd, I'd probably just defer to uh, a report that um the group uh, wildlands network did uh, a year or two ago where they basically um, you know, they they sort of pulled together, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of data and identified a, a bunch of potential hotspots. Uh, you know, I'll add that um, you know there's also a, the great uh, road ecology center at UC Davis. Uh, you know, which which has something called the the California Roadkill Observation System, which is basically this citizen science database of of, uh, of roadkill sightings that has identified you know these very discrete hotspots uh, around around the state for for mitigation. So. I'll just, you know, kind of uh, as a non-Californian, I'll just plead the fifth and say, check out, uh, you know, UC Davis's uh, various reports on this subject because they've, you know, they've identified lots of, uh, of, of really important uh, hotspots for mitigation. I mean, you know, certainly I-15, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a wildlife crossing that's, you know, kind of, uh, I think in, in planning stages now, um, you know, in the Santa Cruz mountains, uh, you know, that that's, uh, there, there are several that are kind of in development. Um, yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll just say that, I mean, there, you know, there, there are just, I mean, there's just so many right now that are, you know, that are, are being planned and built and, uh, discussed. It's, you know, it, it is really a, a pretty exciting time. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the very large, very visible one down on Highway 101 in Southern California causes a renaissance of interest and maybe funding for wildlife crossings. I remember the first wildlife crossing I ever saw was way far eastern Nevada, you know, middle of nowhere. At first, I didn't even know what it was. And then when we figured out later from the signs, and one of my first thoughts was, why don't we have those all over in the Bay Area and Southern California? And we're starting to, I guess. Um, but I'd love to see more of that. I think Highway 152, there is one being planned. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be others. Um, and one of the other things that I 
that's related to what you had been talking about, the newts up in Northern California. We actually have a study down here by the Lexington, Lexington Reservoir. Uh, Marav Vonshak has been studying the newt kills that constantly happen as the newts migrate down from the hills trying to get to the reservoir. Right. And how can we how can we save them? And it really takes people to uh, to fight for the cause to get attention to it at all. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Oh, absolutely. For this. Yeah. So there's uh, in in your presentation uh, you, you spoke uh, mostly about uh, land animals, and I'm wondering um, along Highway Five that leads up and down through the state, of course. Um, every time I've driven down that um, at night, I've noticed uh, barn owls there, and they routinely get sucked into the tailwind of vehicles and end up dead by the side of the road. So, you know, a, a, a drive from here to Los Angeles, you can come across a dozen barn owls by the side of the road. Do you have any thoughts on what could help uh, lessen that amount of carnage? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a really... A really tough one. I mean, you know, bird strikes in general are, are a very difficult, uh, you know, nut, nut to crack. I mean, it, it's, um, I guess I would say, you know, this is not exactly barn owl specific, um, but, you know, a, a couple of good examples of, of avian uh, vehicle collision mitigation out there. Um, either, you know, there are several places um, where roadside poles have been helpful. Um, there's a kind of a famous uh, causeway in Florida that had um, very high rates of turn collisions. Uh, and so they lined the, the causeway um, with uh, with these, you know, these, these big white poles that basically induced the turns to fly over traffic rather than through traffic. Um, and that uh, that dramatically reduced uh, turn strikes. Um, which is which is kind of kind of cool. So you know it is it is possible uh, to to mitigate bird strikes in some instances. Um, you know another another really big source of uh, you know of, of avian mortality along roads are you know scavenging raptors, right? You know come come down to feast on uh, you know on deer and elk carcasses. Um, and uh, there's actually a, a really cool project that's being done by Hawk Watch International right now, um, where they basically uh, you know spent years studying golden eagle collisions in uh, in the in the West and you know sort of figure that figured out that if you can if you drag a, a carcass 40 feet off the road um that's basically you know, enough distance that the that the, the birds can feed on the carcass um safely and without flushing every time uh, you know a truck a truck goes by um and now they've got this this winter they'll have uh you know road crews out in uh I want to say Wyoming, Utah, and Oregon, uh, moving moving deer and elk carcasses off the highway uh, to provide this you know this this safe resource for uh, for scavenging raptors. Um, so again, not barn owl specific, but uh, you know just a couple of cool examples of, uh, of avian mitigation. Fantastic, um, Barry. I saw something in the chat about um, let's see, uh, cliff swallows. Yeah, I Could... yeah, there are more questions in the chat now. Uh, the cliff swallow one. Uh, Michael Hawk says, could you speak about the forced adaptation or evolution seen in swallows in Nebraska? Yeah, this is this is uh, actually like the sort of the first. This is the introduction to the to the book just because I find it's it's such a it's such a cool story and it's probably oh. a story that's that's familiar to a few of a few of you folks. Um, but uh, you know, there's just this this wonderful piece of research um, that was done by a, a scientist named Charles Brown, sort of the world's leading expert on uh, on cliff swallows. Uh, and you know what what he noticed. Uh, you know, and he's been studying cliff swallows for decades. And you know what he what he noticed around 2010 or so was that he he'd been seeing much less cliff swallow roadkill over time. You know, starting in the 1980s, he would see mm. lots of dead cliff swallows. And over time, he just saw fewer and fewer um, dead swallows, even though, uh, you know, sort of cliff swallow populations were, were doing better than ever. Um, and so, you know, he sort of deduced that cliff swallows uh, which of course you know are very exposed to cars given that they nest on you know highway bridges and, and uh, overpasses uh you know he deduced that cliff swallows were somehow becoming less susceptible to being hit by by passing vehicles and you know when he studied many decades of swallow specimens what he discovered uh is that their their wings are getting shorter over time uh and the reason for that is that long wings are good for flying long straight distances and short wings are good for 
making lots of tight turns and rolls and maneuverability, avoiding 18 wheelers. And the long oh. cliff swallows uh, were getting, you know, got weeded out of the population by roadkill um, and the short wing swallows survived. And so it was, it was kind of this very textbook case of, uh, of natural selection uh, driven by traffic, which is just, you know, again, I mean, so mind blowing to think about, right? We think about evolution as this process that happens over, you know, thousands or millions of years. And yet, you know, here was evolution happening in the course of uh, a couple of decades because, uh, you know, roadkill is just such a strong selective pressure. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. amazing. Um, Shani would like to know if you know uh, other projects that are happening in the Bay Area, and uh, and maybe this is a question for Matthew, but what SCVS SCVAS is doing around this, these areas? Well, I'd really like Shani to speak about that. Um, I'm um, <laughs> sure she'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, Shani, that would be fantastic to hear from you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Thank you. Yep. Yes, yep. Course. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I'm sure uh, Dr. Goffab knows about these projects, but we have quite a few that Audubon, our chapter, has been involved in, including um, overcrossing on 152, which already is in motion. Uh, the one that was the one in uh, San Benito County on 101 that is just starting the process with hopefully get funded tomorrow at the Fish and Wildlife uh, com mm. uh, Commission mm. in, uh, Sac in Sacramento. We have the NEWT project, which is moving forward with uh, MidPen already completed the first phase, which was identifying projects that are uh, likely to help the NEWTs cross um, the road over near Lexington Reservoir. Uh, but we're probably the best project would take too long for this population to survive. So we had to kind of look at both the feasibility of projects, but also how long it will take to get them moving forward so that we don't lose that population before the uh, project is done. And then there are quite a few um, ideas moving forward near Coyote Valley and Highway 17. So I just think, you know, the people on this call who are our members should know that we're really active on this issue. And mm -hmm. uh, that's all. Thanks. And our work on the dark and sky the initiatives. Dark sky initiatives. And, yeah, very right. And bird Sorry. safety. Yeah. And road safety yeah, and, and yeah, bird strikes on windows. These are all related. So those are all good work. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really glad uh, Shani spoke. She is, in case you don't know, she is our, our full-time environmental advocate. So she and the Environmental Action Committee uh, do a lot of work on these issues, uh, and it's incredibly important. And it's a, it's a major uh, it's a major effort on our part to to support their activities. Yeah, well, th th well, thank you so much, and th thanks, thanks, Shani, for for that uh, that rundown. Some of those projects I'd heard of, and and uh, some I hadn't. So I'm I'm really excited to uh, learn about all all you guys are working on, and and really uh, appreciative. Thank you. Any other questions, Barry? Well, uh, Julie Rose asks, "Is there a way for more people to get involved?" That's a nice segue. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like talk talk to talk to Shani. Uh, <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> that is the best answer. <laughs> Actually, that's an excellent answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, I'd also add too. I mean, that you know, that that um, you know, that I mean, that California Roadkill Observation System, that Citizen Science Project run by UC Davis. I mean, that you know, they they really are. There are that project has been so helpful in identifying you know collision hotspots for for mitigation and and uh, you know, and that's I mean, that's one way in which. Anybody can contribute to this to this the, the solutions, right? We're all driving around out there. We're all noticing roadkill. Uh, you know, we all have a chance to kind of participate in uh, in data collection and uh, you know and and um, the research that underpins wildlife crossings. So that's you know the California Roadkill Observation Systems another another great way to get involved. So um, cool. uh, Ben, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. This is a hugely important issue, uh, and uh, I'm so glad you were able to walk us through. Uh, the complexity of it and, you know, the possible solutions and, and uh, the examples that you cited. And I want to thank uh, Michael for bringing Ben to us tonight. And I, I also want to put in a plug for Nature's Archive, uh, Michael's podcast, on which you can hear further conversations with Ben. 
Um, so I think we'll say good night and everybody, uh, this will, this has been recorded. We will post it hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, you can watch it again and again. Thank you, Shawnee, for your comments about the EA committee and, and, uh, Audubon's work in this area. And Ben, thank you so much. Once again, really appreciated a fantastic conversation. Um, and, uh, Look forward to hearing from you again and uh, seeing another book in the future, perhaps. Oh boy. All right. <laughs> Fresh, the pressure's yes, out. Thank now. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, good night. Yes. Uh, stay well, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Good night, everybody.